Hello. This is a second in a series of interviews which Donor to Donor is conducting with leaders in the field of living organ transplant. You will find these interviews and more on the Donor to Donor YouTube channel. Today we are interviewing Garrett Hill, the founder and CEO of the National Kidney Registry. Garrett and his wife started the NKR in 2007 following their struggle to find a compatible donor for their daughter who had lost her kidney function at age 10. Both Garrett and Jan were incompatible donors and were unable to find a compatible donor for their daughter through all of the parent exchange programs operating in the US at that time. Garrett donated his kidney on behalf of his daughter through the NKR voucher program in 2015 creating a voucher for his daughter in the event she would ever need a transplant in the future. The NKR has grown every year since its inception and is now the largest parent exchange program in the world, affiliated with just under 100 US transplant centers. NKR is on track to facilitate 70% of all paired kidney exchange transplants in the country this year. As a donor-led organization, NKR is on the forefront of providing comprehensive protections and support to living kidney donors through the Donor Shield program. The Donor Shield program is unmatched by any donor protection program in the world. Garrett, let's start by asking you to go back and explain what it was about the experience with your daughter's transplant that motivated you to start the National Kidney Registry. Yeah, thanks, Ned, for the introduction, and thanks for doing these educational videos. Uh, so it started with our daughter losing her kidney function, um, and uh, she was an A blood type. She is an A blood type. My wife was a B blood type. She, she was blood type incompatible. We knew that pretty early on. I'm an A blood type, so I was blood type compatible, and I actually passed the first cross match at the transplant center. Um, but as our daughter's immune system came back online, she developed more antibodies, uh, in the second time, it was literally three days before the transplant or two days before the transplant, we got a call. Uh, I was incompatible because she had developed a, an antigen against my B60. Uh, she had developed an antibody against my B60 antigen. So I washed out of the process being antibody incompatible. We then tried to enroll in every paired exchange program in the United States. And in 2007, there were probably about a dozen of them. Most of them were uh, connected to a hospital uh, and require you to travel to that transplant center to participate in their paired exchange program. Uh, we were successful in enrolling in two of the paired exchange programs, but never got a match. They would run the match runs every six months or three months. Uh, and it just seemed like if we could bring all of the transplant centers together, together on one platform, uh, the math would say that we'd get a lot of people transplanted. So it was a big problem, but there was a huge benefit if we could solve that problem. And so that's kind of the mindset my wife and I had when we went into this is, let's take a shot at it because it is a huge problem, but the, the upside was so important for so many people and we'd experienced it firsthand. So we never got a match offer out of those systems that we entered. Uh, and we were very lucky that after screening a, a lot of potential donors, um, we had a donor who came forward who was uh, compatible uh, that was my nephew, and he donated to my daughter in 2007. Please explain what differentiates the NKR from a paired exchange program run by a single transplant center. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, if you're running a paired exchange program in a single center, uh, you will be able to, uh, if the logistics are easier, you're not shipping kidneys around the country. Um, it's less expensive. You don't have the cost related to all that overhead of coordinating between the centers, shipping organs, uh, but you're, you've got a limited volume. Uh, so uh, generally, uh, you're not able to match and transplant people as fast, and you're not able to match hard-to-match pairs as easily. And so uh, we see about 1,000 donors a year that enter our system, and that makes it very easy for highly sensitized patients to get matched and transplanted. When we look at the data, we start, we see uh, patients that have a 99% or lower CPRA get matched and transplanted very quickly, within months. Uh, and even when you're above 99%, we're very successful in matching and transplanting patients up to a 99.7% CPRA, generally within a year. Uh, so the, the volume of, of donors coming through the system 
gives uh, a national program the ability to make much more, much faster matches, much more precise matches. And also, um, uh, if you're a compatible pair, we have a lot of compatible pairs that enter the NKR to get a better match. Uh, and we know that a better match allows that kidney to function typically longer. And, uh, and if you get a great match, you can generally reduce the immunosuppressive medication dosages, which are very important to patients. And so, uh, you know, it's a local program or a single center program. There's about a dozen of them in the United States. Um, again, it's less, less expensive to run. It's easier to coordinate, uh, but you're not going to get the matches and the patients are going to wait longer. Uh, just to back up, um, can you explain what a CPRA is? You're talking about someone who's 99% CPRA? Yeah, uh, good question. So there's two fundamental forms of incompatibility. There's blood type incompatibility. For example, a B donor cannot give to an A blood type recipient. That's an uh, incompatible blood type combination. And then there's uh, what we call antibody incompatibility. So if a person has developed antibodies, those usually come from a blood transfusion, a prior transplant, or pregnancy. One of those three things. We've seen antibodies get created other ways, but those are the three primary ways antibodies get created. My daughter had antibodies because she had uh, blood transfusions when she was in the hospital. And so if you have a, a, a PRA, it stands for panel reactive uh, antibodies. If you have uh, an uh, 80% PRA. That means you're going to fail the cross match with 80% of the people in the general population. If you have a 99% CPRA, you're going to fail the cross match with 99% of people in the general population. So as the CPRA gets higher, it gets harder and harder to find a match. Uh, and so with a lot of volume, it's very easy for us to match a 99% CPRA patient because if we're seeing a thousand donors a year, well, you know, 1% of 1,000, you know, that's still a lot of donors. That's 10 donors, and that means you're going to see about one a month. Uh, so it's very easy to get matched if you have a 99% CPRA, and you're exposed to the NKR pool. From your experience as a living donor, you've created a suite of protections for donors that is available uh, to all U.S. transplant centers. This is a two-part question. Please describe those protections, and then explain why these protections are generally only offered by NKR member centers? Uh, so right now there are seven uh, protections and support. There's lost wage uh, reimbursement. Uh, so we'll reimburse up to four weeks of lost wages for up to $1,500 a week. Uh, travel and lodging reimbursement. We'll re reimburse up to $2,000 in travel and lodging costs. Uh, life insurance, and this is life insurance to cover the donor uh, for donation. Um, there's a $500,000 principal amount. Uh, disability insurance is $1,500 a week for up to 52 weeks a year. If, some, if you had a complication coming out of the surgery that caused you to not be able to go to back to work, uh, we provide legal support. Uh, so, uh, for example, if a donor gets uh, terminated from their job because they legally took time off to donate, um, we'll step in and help, help uh, solve that problem. Uh, we've won two cases like that. Uh, we'll also step in if there's a problem with the health insurance, but amazingly, we've never seen a problem with health insurance. Uh, so, uh, but we're there if, if the donor has a problem and needs legal support. And then we also cover uncovered uh, donor complication costs. Uh, so let's say you donate your kidney and six months later, you have a hernia as a result uh, from the kidney donation, but the insurance company that insured the patient uh, stopped their coverage at 90 days, um, we'll step in and cover that, uh, that complication. Again, very rare that this occurs, but very important coverage. And then finally, uh, we'll reimburse for complication-related uh, travel and lost wages. So if you had that hernia six months after you donated, and you had to take two weeks off work, we'll reimburse you for the two weeks you took off work and any travel and lodging related to getting that hernia operation and fixing the problem. So those are the seven uh, donor protections and support uh, for Donor Shield. Uh, the second part of your question is, um, you know, uh, uh, why are these protections generally offered only by NKR member centers? So it's kind of a two-part answer. The first thing is that, um, any donor that goes to an NKR center is involved in an NKR swap automatically gets donor shield coverage. 
Uh, and so we have close to 100 transplant centers out there that are offering uh, donor shield uh, to donors that come through just because it's part of the NKR uh, process. Um, there are a few centers that are providing donor shield to all their donors if they go through NKR or if they go through the direct donation process. Uh, the, we have offered this and we've communicated to all the transplant centers in the United States that this is available. There's a fee for this to the transplant centers um, and maybe that's why they uh, none of the non-NKR centers have approached us to do this. We've had a couple conversations, but we really want to encourage non-NKR centers, even if they're not working with an impaired exchange, we want to offer donor shield through those centers too. How do uh, NKR facilitated transplant outcomes compare to the industry as a whole? Uh, so uh, we actually have it on our website. I should have loaded it up before we started. Uh, so if you go to the National Kidney Registry website in the upper, uh, uh, kind of on the left-hand side, uh, it shows uh, the comparison. We're using uh, NKR outcomes compared against uh, U.S. living donor transplants as recorded uh, by the SRTR database. Uh, so right now at uh, three years, the NKR uh, graph failure rate is 20% lower uh, than the typical living donor transplant uh, graph failure rate. At five years, uh, the NKR is 12% lower uh, than the typical living donor transplant. And at seven years, you know, the longer you go, kind of the, the more exacerbated that differential is, we're 26% uh, lower uh, than the typical uh, living donor transplant in the United States. Uh, we see that probably expanding over time as we are able to get better matches. Uh, We've started looking at epitope mismatch uh, analysis when you're looking at donor recipient matches, which is a more advanced way to, to figure out who's a great match. Uh, and I think as we implement that, we'll see the differential between living donor transplants in the United States and NKR transplants. We'll see that graph failure differential increase over time. And we've actually been watching it over the last four or five years, it has increased over time. So hopefully it'll continue to get better. This is a little bit of inside baseball, but what is your view on the National Living Donor Assistance Center's donor support program, also known as NALDAC, and how does that support compare to what the NKR offers? So NALDAC was the first organization, the first national organization to offer donors reimbursement for travel and lodging. Uh, and they've won, uh, they've won grants from the government over the last, I'd say 10 years, so they were a real pioneer uh, first one to offer this travel and lodging uh, reimbursement. Uh, they're also piloting a lost wage uh, reimbursement program. I think they're in five or six centers around the country. Uh, so uh, they, they were clearly the first pioneer that did a lot of great work. Uh, the Donor Shield program, though, it includes uh, travel and lodging reimbursement. And the differential between NALDAC and NKR here, or NALDAC and Donor Shield, is that we have no income cap. It doesn't matter how much money the patient makes or the donor makes, we don't means test any of the donors. If you have costs related to the donation, we think you should be reimbursed. And so uh, that's a big differential on the travel and lodging. And on the lost wages, um, we have a full bulk program. What we understand is now that has started to roll it out, but it's not available. It's not widely available. But we also have those other five uh, protections that are critical for donors, the life insurance, the disability insurance, legal support, coverage for uncovered complications, and reimbursement for any complication related travel and lodging costs. So um, there's, uh, you know, that's it's kind of comparing a car engine with a, a car that has tires and everything on it. So there's a lot, there's a lot more components to the Donor Shield program. And we're going to continue to add components over time just so that donors are completely protected as much as we possibly can protect the donors. We're gonna, we're gonna continue to evolve it and, and we're looking to make sure that uh, there are no disincentives to kidney donation, at least financial disincentives. Look, there's pain, you and I both donated, right? It's a painful process, it's a challenging process. You recover quickly um, and you know most donors do ex extremely well after transplant. But we just want to provide that additional security uh, for donors so they don't have to worry about some of these things that may never happen, but they're very, they're very real issues that some people worry about. Are there circumstances where a donor at an NKR member center does not qualify 
for the donor shield protections? Good question. Uh, so if you go to an NKR member center and you want the donor shield protections, there's kind of two, two types of centers out there. You've got centers that can offer those donor shield protections only if that donor participates in an NKR swap. Uh, so the bottom line is any donor who goes to any of our member centers can get the donor shield protections, but in most centers, they have to participate in an NKR swap. Uh, so we have about 100 centers, about 20 of those centers have added what we call donor shield direct. Uh, so if you go to one of those centers and you're not involved in a donor shield uh, or an NKR swap, you will still be covered by the donor shield protections, but it's still the minority of centers. And if a donor um, is, is kind of interested in making sure they get the donor shield protections, we encourage them to talk to the transplant center about that to make sure that they go through the right pathway so they can get that donor shield protection. Donor to donor has facilitated a number of family voucher and standard voucher transplants through the NKR. Please explain the NKR voucher program and why it is such a powerful tool for both donors and recipients. So there are two different voucher programs. There's the family voucher program and then there's the standard voucher program. The family voucher program uh, is a program for a person like me. I donated on behalf of my daughter and she got a voucher and she was not in imminent need of a transplant. So it's a, a voucher that I hope never gets redeemed. Most family voucher donors, all of them, will hope that, they, that those vouchers are never redeemed because those vouchers are going to people who don't need a transplant. Now, maybe somebody will need a transplant in the future, um, and that's what those vouchers are for. So the family voucher program allows for five vouchers to go to family members in case any of those five uh, uh, people ever need a transplant in the future. Now, we can't redeem all five. The math doesn't support that. The first person who redeems one of those vouchers will be prioritized for living donor kidney through the NKR, and then the other four outstanding vouchers would be voided. So that's the family voucher program, and we offer that because, uh, and this is really for non-directed donors, a good Samaritan donor comes forward, they just wanna help somebody in need. They don't know somebody that needs a transplant. Historically, those folks have been uh, the, the people who've started chains, uh, domino chains, pioneered at Hopkins back in the early 2000s. I think you, you interviewed Bob Montgomery in a prior video. His team was the one that started that, very powerful uh, process. And we, we looked at these donors, these wonderful people starting chains, and we said, well, how can we eliminate even more disincentives that they may be facing that we haven't really thought too much about? And one thing that I've talked to a lot of, of, of potential donors, donors like myself, and you know, they said that, look, what if one of my children or my spouse needs a kidney in the future? And so that's pretty compelling. Uh, and the family voucher program is set up to take that disincentive away so that if you're worried about, you know, Ned, you're a donor, you donated your kidney, you may have children, you may have people in your family that you want to protect. You can then uh, get those people a voucher so that if somebody happens to have kidney failure, it's a very low probability, but they'll be prioritized uh, for living donor transplant. So the family voucher program really focused on non-directed donors taking away that disincentive that they may not be, help, be able to help one of their family members in the future if they ever need a transplant. The standard voucher program is a totally different uh, kind of uh, uh, model. The standard voucher program, it was really created to break up the pair, to, to decouple the pair, and that's the pair in parent exchange or the pair in direct donation transplant. And so why would you wanna do the standard voucher program? Well, the first thing is anybody who goes through the standard voucher program and the family voucher program for that matter automatically gets donor shield because it's automatically an NKR organized swap. So you don't have to think about it. So you get donor shield, but the other thing the stand standard voucher program does is it allows you the donor to donate according to your time schedule. So we had, we had one young man who was in the Navy, he was on leave, his mother needed a, a transplant, but he could only get leave in December, and his mother wasn't ready for the transplant, she still had some testing and work up to do, 
I think we transplanted her March or April, three, four months later. Um, this young man needed to get back to his ship, which is in the Pacific Ocean. So he donated through the standard voucher program, created a voucher for his mom. His mom then redeemed that voucher four months later. So it really works well when people have time constraints and they don't want to be tied to the time frame of when their, their patient or their loved one is ready to be transplanted. Also, we're seeing a lot of utilization uh, of this program for uh, spouses. The spouse is taking care of, you know, the, let's say the, the wife is donating to the husband and the, you know, and, and they're donating either direct donation transplant or parent exchange transplant. And the wife is the caretaker for the husband who's getting the transplant, but she's undergoing surgery at the same time. The standard voucher program allows the, the wife to donate uh, two months before, recover from kidney donation, and the, the husband comes in, and the husband can take care of the wife after her surgery or donation surgery, and then the wife can take care of the husband after his transplant surgery. So it allows uh, a kind of a better plan uh, for taking care of the donor and the recipient. And then finally, what we're seeing on the standard voucher program is the decoupling of these pairs so that, first of all, the, the donor can donate as soon as they want, whenever they want, but then the patient can go into the pool where they're seeing a thousand donors a year and they can get the best possible match without having to coordinate with the, the other, the donor's donation time. And so we're seeing a trend now of these decoupling of pairs so that the patient can get a better match, better match, less rejection, less rejection, longer lasting kidney, and also better match, lower immunosuppression. Okay, thank you. Um, I know that uh, donors through the NKR are prioritized for a living kidney uh, should they need one in the future. Uh, as rare as that might be, how important is that? And uh, is that offered to all donors throughout the transplant system? So uh, we started that policy really early on. Um, where if you're, and we, we started originally with just Good Samaritan donors, the people who were starting chains, we said, look, if you ever have kidney failure and need a kidney, you can come back to the NKR and be prioritized for living donor transplant. Uh, so we've been doing this for a very long time. We realized that the probability of a donor ever coming back to us and redeeming that voucher, so to speak, was pretty low. And we expanded that program, I think it was maybe five years ago, to include all donors in the NKR, not just the Good Samaritan donors starting the chains. So we expanded it uh, to all NKR donors. And uh, that, that, you know, like I said, we never had a case where somebody's come back yet. You know, it's going to happen eventually as we get more and more people transplanted and our donors age. You know, I suspect that we're going to get some of these folks to come back and need to be prioritized for living donor transplant. So I think it's a very important uh, aspect of our program because it gives the donor that peace of mind knowing that, you know, they gave up a kidney. And the fact is that there's a very small probability that they'll need a you know, kidney during their lifetime, but let's cover that base. You know, that's my view. Uh, so it's only available to donors who donate through an NKR swap because we just don't have the mathematics right now to provide this to every donor in the United States. I wish we could. And maybe as we grow, we will be able to do that. Uh, but uh, it's only available to NKR donors. And, uh, you know, the other thing that everybody needs to know is any living donor, anybody who donates a kidney in the United States automatically gets prioritized on the deceased donor wait list. And so, um, you know, the donors have that kind of the basic protection now where they're going to get any donor in the United States is going to get prioritized on the deceased donor wait list. But a living donor kidney lasts twice as long, you know, depending on how you calculate, maybe three times as long as a deceased donor organ. So it'd be much better uh, to get that, that living donor, a living donor kidney if we can. And that's why we started that program. We want to just do everything we can for donors so that they they minimize any kind of risk or downside in this process. The National Kidney Registry has been an innovator and change agent in this industry since its inception. What do you see on the horizon for the transplant industry? 
So I, I think, you know, there are, there are three big initiatives that I see kind of expanding going forward that will have a big impact on donors and patients. Uh, the first one is Donor Shield. You know, Donor Shield has been adopted by a lot of centers. Uh, you know, all of the NKR centers are utilizing Donor Shield as part of NKR swaps. I see that eventually growing in all U.S. transplant centers using that capability because it's the right thing to do for donors. Um, it's not, you know, it's not terribly expensive for the hospitals. Maybe the government will get involved at some point and reimburse those costs. Um, we've, we've made those, those overtures, uh, but I think it's just the right thing to do, and it makes a lot of sense uh, for, for Donor Shield to be adopted 100% around the country. So I think, I think in the future, that'll be the case. Um, the second thing that we see happening is the decoupling of pairs, whether that's a direct donation transplant or a paired exchange transplant, we see this general trend where uh, the donors and the, the patients would much prefer to go into the standard voucher program. One, so the donor can donate whenever they want and they can they, they get the caretaker issue. Uh, but on the patient side, we're able to get better and better matches on the patients, number one, because we have more donors coming through the system. But number two, we have more advanced technology to, to identify what those great matches are. And that's the third uh, thing that I see, which is very exciting. Uh, research done by uh, Peter Nickerson and his team out of Canada, papers published in 2017 and 2018, uh, clearly demonstrate that if you get a, a better match, and this the match is defined by class two eplets, class two eplet mismatches, and it's I don't want to get into the weeds on this, but it's a very difficult thing to pin down. You have to have very high resolution tissue typing for the donor and the recipient. Uh, we're hitting two international databases to figure out what these eplets are, kind of in real time. And then once we have that data for the donor and recipient, we can do that eplet mismatch analysis automatically. And if you can, if you can improve that eplet mismatch, and ideally you want a zero mismatch, and, and interestingly, our first match on this platform was a zero eplet mismatch donor recipient uh, match. And when you can, we can achieve that, what happens is there are fewer de novo DSAs, and de novo DSAs are the precursors of graft failure in many cases. And so the better that that eplet match is, the less uh, chance there is for graft failure, the longer those kidneys last. And so we've, we've uh, called this program Kidney for Life because we think that if we do this uh, in volume, most of the transplants that are facilitated through this mechanism will last a lifetime, which is really a, a wonderful thing, you know, not to have to go back for a second or third transplant. Uh, this, the, the other aspect of this is that if you have a, a great match, um, the, the research shows that you can safely lower immunosuppression. So, you know, every kidney transplant patient is very familiar with the immunosuppression and the side effects of immunosuppression over the long term. Immunosuppression is challenging, and the less immunosuppression you can take, the better off you are long term as a patient. And so, improving this match allows us to safely lower that immunosuppression. Um, we, you know, that it's something that will be studied over the next few years. We hope that it will evolve, but we're hoping that uh, with these better matches and better science around the matches and the post-transplant monitoring, uh, that we can achieve both goals, L you know, longer uh, kidney life years, kidneys for life, uh, and lower immunosuppression. Well, Garrett Hill, that ha this has been a, a uh, most informative interview. I thank you very much for your time. I know that uh, uh, donors, potential donors and recipients will all learn a great deal from this. And we'll have it up on our Donor to Donor channel uh, on YouTube um, at, very shortly. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Thanks, Ned. Have a great day.